Aloha! Welcome to another Hour Undoing Radio. I am Jeremy Vaney, and I am here to uh, persuade you away from a technocratic future. How does that sound? As I'd mentioned previously this season, uh, I, I um, had the good fortune of speaking to uh, a bunch of people through Tom Cheatham. Um, to talk about my book Urgency and sort of my autobiography, I suppose, and take questions and all of that. And there was one guy who uh, bugged me <laughs> almost more than others. Um, probably more than others. Mainly because he was in denial of global warming, global climate change, global environmental collapse crisis, whatever verbiage we're using these days, um, and was saying that my um, use of that, or my focus of that, in urgency and in life, I guess, um, stems from my being uh, someone who's had these quote-unquote enlightenment experiences, that essentially it's like I'm a prophet of old and all prophets of old uh think the world is ending <laughs> like everyone yells the sky is falling at the end of the century and everyone thinks that the collapse um of of an empire even means the end of the world and while i understand you know i understand what he's saying it seems foolish to me to ignore that in fact yes the boy who cried wolf but this time there's a wolf um However, what he believed should be the human future uh, is also its own apocalypse, whichever strain you want to take. He's one of them, uh, you know, tech bro guys. You know, the tech bro guys? Uh, <laughs> they think, like, we're all going to be either A, downloaded into a virtual reality, B, downloaded into our consciousness into, like, robots, or C, we're going to, like, fly to Mars and terraform it and live there. Um, I can't remember which version of that he believed. I, I think he was of the downloading our consciousness persuasion, but I think he's probably open to going to Mars. But all of those are uh, human apocalypses, are they not? Are they not the end of humanity as we know it? You would call that evolution, right? <laughs> But is it evolution, or is it um, really a, a mutation into mm, just more of ourselves through an insecurity that our bodies aren't perfect? And so, you know, if the body is imperfect, how are we with our imperfect bodies going to make some perfection that we're going to thrust ourselves into? It doesn't make any sense. But we like to believe that our imaginations are more God than, than our concepts of God. And so we, uh, you know, throw ourselves into our, our work. So I want to talk a little bit about, before I get into deconstructing all of that, why I used uh, global warming in my book Urgency. It wasn't just that I had gotten messages in various ways about this. All of which I think I've talked about here, certainly on Paratopia, which is on the Hour and Doing radio station here. But, I mean, it seems to me that somebody who is not me, <laughs> who is an intelligence um, that speaks to me, through me, but isn't me, unless I'm crazy, you know, somewhere in there, uh, has wanted me to know, at least since high school, that... Um, through our own hand, the world is collapsing. The ecology is collapsing. We're killing off other life through our pollution. Now we're at the point where we're also killing ourselves off through the global climate crisis that is also at the hands of our, well, pollution. And, of course, there are those who hide behind that it's cyclical, that it's natural, it's cycles, it's... And so my point with, you know, 
sort of trying to use this as a wake up call is like, um, as I've said before, we don't have the luxury of saying, oh, well, if you don't understand yourself, if you don't come to human wholeness in this life, then the next. Um, if there is no next, if there is no hum- human form to reincarnate into, if, if one believes in reincarnation, then um, guess what? <laughs> You're like, what, a trapped soul in stasis forever and ever? Like, is that is that your state? Or if you don't believe in reincarnation, but you just have some sense of, like, being decent has its own meaning... Um, being a good person has meaning, not murdering everyone and everything for selfish gain is the appropriate way to express yourself as life. Just something very basic like that, then maybe you need to understand that this mind of ours that is doing all of the killing isn't capable of not doing that. The self is what's doing all of that, and so one needs to understand the self for selflessness to be the case. And that selflessness, that nothingness, that absence, is its own balance, is its own understanding, is truth per se, and that that becomes you in the absence of the brain projecting you. And that it might be important to, you know, get around to this now. Because there is no evolving into that. There is no waiting for a next life to achieve that. There's no achieving it. There's just seeing it right now. <laughs> I mean, you're either trapped in time or you're, you're un- or not. Or you understand nowness. You are living in the now, man. And it doesn't matter which lifetime, you know, you put that off for. You're still not doing it. So... We need to do it, and no better time than the present, especially when we see that we are, in fact, trying to outrun a giant monster that we have created. Um, Which was not true at any other point in history as far as I know, at least on this massive global scale. There may have been, you know, islands that had used up resources and were dying off or, you know, things of that nature, but not the big global catastrophe that we are creating. But yet, here's a person who is young, even, not even an old-timer who doesn't want to deal with what they've done to the world and is in denial, but a younger person who's might even be younger than me, who's in denial of this and just passing it off as, like, an artifact of a prophet. Um, just something that happens on the way to spiritual epiphany or something, but is actually not meaningful. It's just sort of almost mechanical, Um, or perhaps a misinterpretation, you know, sort of, maybe I'm what? I don't know what. I don't know what it would be. Um, Taking the um, collapse of self and putting it into an environmental collapse? I don't know what he's thinking. (laughs) I, I just know that he's thinking, and that's the whole of the problem. So... That was my way of, of uh, you know, framing um, the book in terms of urgency as a way of moving people to action. I mean, Jiddu Krishnamurti used to say metaphorically, it's like your house is on fire, do something. If your house is on fire, you would act. You would not react. You would act. You wouldn't take the time to think about it. You would do right action. Get the hell out of there. Put it out, get out of there, whatever the right action is. And what I'm saying is, we're literally on fire. The house is on fire. Act. And I know that, and and I've expressed this in the book as well, even so, even saying that, it can't be used as a means to um, cajole you into seeing this. Like, you can't see this out of the fear. You can't can't understand the, the... necessity uh, for the self to dissolve um, out of fear that the world is ending, and if you don't do something about it, then that's going to happen. So I did try to sort of balance the two 
and I, however successful I was at it, I don't know. Um, but I just feel like the way to do that and the way that I do do that is like by showing you my hand at every turn of the magic trick, constantly showing you what I'm doing and why I'm doing it or what I'm saying and why I'm saying it and what other people constantly mean throughout the ages when they say these things, why it never works, why it can't work, you know, all your meditations, your yogas, your uh, moving up the spiritual hierarchy that doesn't exist, you know, all of that. And um, in all of the sort of manipulative salesman tricks that that I may use, um, I immediately expose as I'm saying them. Because it's important to do that. It's important to deconstruct what you're doing as you're doing it. That's the entire point. <laughs> um, but now, I just want to, again, get back to this idea that... Oh, I'm, I, first of all, believe that humanity is ending and, and it's just because I've had these experiences, but that doesn't mean that they're true. They're somehow metaphorically the case and, and that I'm literalizing them. Um, I don't even mean just humanity. I mean, we've been exterminating species since forever, I don't, since industrialization, Forget humanity. How about all of the animals, all of the plants, the flora and the fauna, all of the beings who, because we've allowed ourselves to see them as lesser or even objects, um, not as equals, not as conscious in a way that means anything to us, um, because, of course, you know, it's got to mean something to us for it to be real. Uh, that we just have murdered them. We've, we've genocided them. We've extinguished them from existence. Do we not care about that? Well, I guess you don't care about that if your end goal is to bring about an apocalypse where, like, we all have to stuff ourselves into technology suits to survive. You, too, therefore, believe humanity is ending. It's just that you don't call it that. You want to bring it about by killing off the body and computerizing the soul. <laughs> you think that, that there's a soul, I guess, or some essence of man, some essence that is you, that you're going to digitize? And you think that humanity is so imperfect that you want to leave it? And yet, again, you also ironically believe that humanity will be the one to invent that perfection? And many of us do suffer this delusion that science is perfect. If we can just, you know, we can build perfect systems with science and so forth, despite our actual experience of screwing things up. <laughs> because when we fantasize about this perfect way of building or seeing the world or objectifying and then, you know, extracting the perfect essence of something and building upon that... Um, we have these stupid fantasies that don't include us, as though there is a thing called science that is divorced from the scientist. Divorced from the people who will work the machine once the science and the, has been perfected and the scientist is done with her work. I mean, if you look at just, like, Fukushima, I mean, you look at the Fukushima nuclear meltdown there, even now, there are still large segments of the public who are dying to have the grid go nuclear, even after that, literally dying if they get their way. And they say, you know, oh, it's safe now, right, right, the technology is so much better, right, you can trust it, it's infallible now. Because there's no such thing as human error? No such thing as a programmed computer error? No such thing as hackers, no such thing as an environmental catastrophe, the one like that happened with Fukushima that will eventually impact the new machinery. No such thing as war, like in Ukraine, where the Russians took over the nuclear plant. Remember that? Remember that basically happening yesterday? I mean, we're to all of this is within the last few years, folks. What is it about the promise of scientific perfection that gives us amnesia about the actual actually happening right now? We've put so much stock into our powers of logic and reason that we forgot that we've idealized them and don't really live by them. <laughs> if we did, in exclusion of all our other aspects, that would be its own catastrophe, folks. 
But yeah, let's escape. Let's go into a computer, into a virtual reality world that mimics this one because... What? I thought this one was imperfect. You want to go into a computer landscape that is exactly this? And what? I mean, is this your paradise? Living with this hole inside you so big that you've got to try to invent your way to... I don't know what. The perfection... Perfection doesn't even exist. I don't know. Invent your way into not having to deal with yourself. Or, you know, yeah, let's escape to Mars. That's a great idea. Let's go terraform another planet instead of dealing with this one. And yeah, let's get there on the vision and technology of the ever fashy billionaire, Elon Musk. How's that going to end? Pretty much the way it begins. What are you teaching the computer people inside the computer or the robot or the new Martians? Are you teaching them about objects and separation? Are you teaching them English, the language of war and colonialism? Of course, we already know that, you know, if you're going to Mars or if you're colonizing the inside of a computer, you're, you're learning colonialism. <laughs> what is it that you think is going to be so different and better inside of the less real. I mean, even going to Mars and terraforming is creating a fake environment. I mean, is it going to be like a planet of Las Vegas? Is that what we're going for here? My God, man, we will do anything to not look at ourselves. Including not looking at, once again, and I know I'm a broken record on this, but the link between having those feelings about how all of that is okay in a scientific, technological framework um, because you, th you think that it's like transcending religion or that you've done away with religion and superstition, perhaps, or just a bunch of old stories, all of which is true except, except the part where you've done away with it because you've actually embraced the idea of the Old Testament where the earth is yours to just do what you want with. The animals are just... Things that God put here for you. Everything is here for you. It's this self-centeredness. And that self-centered seed in the Bible has now flowered into this weed of a society and is still germinating and becoming, you know, wants to become this, this extension into virtual reality. The furtherance of the self. Because why? Fear of death. Oh, right. I'm going to live forever in a computer. Fear of death. Fear of the ending of the self. I mean, is it any different than the ancient Egyptian kings and queens who would bring all of their possessions and their servants and their pets into the tomb with them? That's pretty much what each and every one of these tech people who believe in such a future want to do. They want to put themselves in a sarcophagus, <laughs> a virtual reality sarcophagus, with all the happy, fun things that made them feel like they were alive. Instead of just living. Instead of seeing through that. I mean, this is like, to me, virtual reality existence is like the sickness within the sickness. It's like deep mental illness to me as opposed to just good old-fashioned delusion. And I don't mean that literally. I'm not saying, because clearly this is someone who probably uh, is wealthy from his beliefs. I guarantee you he makes a great living off this. Seems to be a computer guy by trade. Um, and also is someone who would be out biking or walking around and would chime in to, to ask questions, not even ask questions really, but to just babble on and on uh, whatever was on his mind after I was done speaking to, to make sure we all knew that he was the smartest guy in the room. But doing it in such a way where we could barely understand anything he was saying because he was outdoors and everything is coming into the microphone, the wind, the, the sounds of other people, of animals, of, you know, whatever, bicycling, whatever it is, you know, the, the camera is shaking, the, you know, all of that stuff, it's all completely selfish. It's all lack of caring about how the listener perceives you or asking a legit question. It's all about just 
being defensive. I want to say my piece. I want to look like the smartest guy in the room and poo-poo this because it gets in the way of my vision of my future. Which, by the way, good for you. Have that vision of that future for you. But don't impose it upon everybody else. I mean, what's the option for everyone else? We've seen the movies. <laughs> we know what happens. The riffraff. They don't get to go into the the rosy virtual reality world. <laughs> they get to sit in the polluted, toxic environment that you guys created. <laughs> I shouldn't say you guys, because we're all doing it. We're all creating it. We're all in on that together. But we're doing it through corporate avatars and um, the heads of those corporations will certainly be the first to embrace whatever they believe is the rosy future and leave us uh, in the dust. But someone's going to have to keep those servers cooled. So guess what? <laughs> you're going to have workers out here and uh, your science is um, actually your, your entire existence is going to be uh, in the hands of Joe Blow. So good luck factoring that into your equation. The physical body is not outdated technology, okay? Let's just get that straight. And you don't know what you are. You have no clue the immensity of not even what you're capable of, because it's what the capability, it's the capability that exists when you're not there. And I know that that's the scary part, the, the death of self, the recontextualization of self. These are all scary things. And yet... You're not afraid to recontextualize yourself in terms of, like, you know, becoming a video game. Might I suggest that's because it's a fantasy? And in reality, it won't quite go the way you're expecting? You won't quite feel the way you think you'd feel about it in reality? And it's the same thing with, with nothingness, with timelessness, with dissolving. Um, how you feel about it from this side of, of that is wholly irrelevant. How you feel inside the egg is wholly ir irrelevant to the animal that has pecked its way out. And you don't have a choice, because you either peck your way out or, you know, eventually, your egg environment collapses and you die. These are your options. You can't fight a polluted future by putting yourself inside the pollution, inside the plastic, inside the wiring inside the cloud. And I feel like this should all be obvious, but it's not. To a lot of people, it's not obvious. You really think they're going to outrun death? They really think they're going to Superman their way into some techno future that only has the meaning they put into it? That only has the creature comforts? That only has the good stuff? You know, whatever it is I like, my interests. I, me, mine, I, me, mine. I mean, just get yourself a couple of mirrors and put them across from each other and watch your reflection go on and on and on infinitely. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. It's so freaking silly, and yet these are the serious people. At least they have serious plans for you. <laughs> for you and me. Whether you like it or not, they're just packaging it as the inevitable, the inevitable future. And meanwhile, we never used to think in terms of projecting a future in the way that we do now. So even this sense of time, of like future forward, living for some becoming, some great becoming of the individual, you know, that used to be reserved for like dictators and stuff, and now everyone wants to be the dictator. Um... So even that is unnatural. Remember when we used to have just sort of innocent, <laughs> pseudo-innocent uh, fantasies about the future? It was like The future was like a staycation, you know, where time becomes uh, about the future, not in terms of like a religious experience like Judgment Day or an apocalypse or global warming, but a technological utopia where robot slaves serve us in our free time, and it's all free time. Remember? Remember that? It was just supposed to be about giving us free time. Now we want to be the robots. 
That original fantasy was t- us telling ourselves that we need to stop becoming and just be. You know, all of our fantasies are just us talking to ourselves about what we don't have. And on the surface, it looks as though we're telling us, like, what we want, what we wish we had. But if you look a little deeper, if you scratch the surface, you see that it's really wholeness trying to talk to you through the delusion of yourself. Just a little echo trying to say, hey, pay a little deeper attention. There's a metaphor here for for what you're deeply missing, which is truth, which is that which the self is blocking out, which is timelessness, which is non-duality, which is simply being and not doing, not becoming. Our new fantasy is that we're the robot slaves. And we think that we're going to be kings and queens. Which is funny, because arguably, the way that we live is that we're all robot slaves who secretly believe we're going to be kings and queens. (laughs) Right? Like, we're already living that. That's called politics. That's called YouTube influencer. That's called... You know, that's the narcissism of the American culture. Now, he wasn't American, but we've exported that for sure. So all of this wanting to be famous, live like a king and queen, but really being a wage slave, thinking that if you identify with the right political party, you're going to get a leg up in the world and you know, all that, you know, win the lottery. All of that wanting to become is... To become what? To become some cultural version of whole, which for us means wealthy. We all want that, or in the case of the virtual reality world, we all want to live happily ever after in our blissful existence. So, in a sense, that computer wanting to live happily ever after in a computer world is like the substitute version of being love, of being whole. I mean, all of this is the substitute of being whole. Um, Not just doing it, but being it. Being able to create a space where you you can block out any negative influence. Any judgmental whatever, whatever. Just have the good feelings. Just be high, man. What is getting high? It's the same thing. It's the yearning to be love. Once you get past the psychological need to be loved whatever it is you lacked in childhood and all that, there we come down to, I need to be love, because that is what you are, fundamentally. But you don't live that in a self-aware way, because that love that you are fundamentally, that wholeness that you are fundamentally, that you're not living in a self-aware way, you can't. You are the thing in the way of it. You, the person yearning for it. You, the person scheming a future. You, doing the exact same thing the pharaohs did in 2024. You are the whole of the problem. You're already virtual, and there's no great hero's journey to go on. There's no mushroom trip that you need to take, or ayahuasca or psilocybin or any of it. There's no meditation for you. There's no yoga for you. There's no breath work. There's no silencing you. There's only seeing this. There's only seeing that the seeker is in the way of that which is sought. And that there may not even be that which is sought. You're so in the way that by even supposing that there is a wholeness, that there is a being love, that that becomes your your goal. So even supposing it gets in the way, becomes... Just a thought construct for the seeker to work with, to think they're getting somewhere or working towards something. That's how delicate this is. That's how much you want to remain you. And that's inwardly. And now outwardly, we're expressing the wanting to be you as digital immortality with complete prejudice against all life. Complete contempt for the very body that you are. Never mind animals. Never mind plants. 
Never mind microorganisms. Never mind planets, suns. None of that is relevant to you. You want to be the plastic. You want to be the wires. You want to be your own vision. Your own imperfect vision is your perfection. And the other name for this is sickness. <laughs>